Today, uh, we are going to have a pleasure of Dr. Peter Sage uh, from the Brigham and Women's Hospital join us. Uh, and uh, as usual, we have this webinar format that's a little different from a regular format uh, that allows you to ask questions by using either the chat or the Q&A uh, or even raise your hand and we'll try to address that uh, as it goes. Uh, I'll pass it on to Thiago uh, to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Leo. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Sage. Uh, Dr. Sage is assistant professor of medicine in Harvard Medical School and associate immunologist at the Brigham and Humans Hospital. Uh, he's also a member of the Committee on Immunology uh, at Harvard Medical School. And today he's gonna be talking about B cells, uh, TFH, TFRs, and uh, allo antibodies. Thanks, Pete, for uh, joining us today, and I will turn over to you. My pleasure, thank you for inviting me to, to speak. So, yeah, as Thiago said, I'm gonna be telling you about transplant immunology 101, uh, B cells and antibody. And I'll preface this by saying I'm not a transplant uh, biologist, so I'm a much more a B cell person. So I think many of the people on this talk, including the panelists, are probably more apt to give this presentation than myself, but I'll see, I'll see what I can do. Um, so the topics I was going to cover today um, is essentially evidence for um, B cell help by T cells. So kind of how antibodies are produced uh, in the immune system, a very um, um, basic uh, immunology 101 kind of perspective. I'll tell you a little bit about T follicular helper cells. So kind of a new understanding about the cells that will allow B cells to produce antibody. I'll go through a, a, a dynamics of a germinal center reaction, so how the immune system will promote antibody responses. And then I'll loop back in to uh, talk a little bit about antibodies in transplantation and why it's a big deal and you know, why we're studying them as well. And so this is very much kind of like a, a, a 101 teaching session, so please stop me if there are any questions. Um, <clears throat> but what I was gonna tell you about is humoral immunity. And so humoral immunity is essentially immunity in which antibodies produced by B cells cause destruction of extracellular microorganisms and also prevent the spread of intracellular infections. And humoral immunity is essentially immunity that's elicited by antibodies, which is very different than cellular immunity. Um, why is humoral immunity important? So the um, effector functions elicited by vaccination is essentially all humoral immunity. Almost every single a vaccine protects you because um, it elicits some sort of antibody well, that will then protect you from some sort of pathogen, either a, um, a bacteria uh, or a virus. And essentially that's um, how all these work, including the seasonal flu vaccine. Um, we can talk about COVID vaccines on a, on a, on a different talk. Uh, so antibodies produced by the immune system are, are really important, uh, not just for vaccination, but also just to protect yourself uh, in general. And so what's the classical view of humoral immunity? So if anyone has the Janeway uh, textbook or at least the 2008 version, um, it's traditionally thought that um, B cells need help from T cells to produce antibody. And this T cell help um, comes from what's called T helper cells. That's why they're referred to as T helper cells. Uh, they'll bind to B cells, they'll produce some sort of cytokines. This causes a plasma cell to form. And then these plasma cells will form some sort of antibody. This antibody thing can then go on and cause effector functions such as neutralization. It can bind to a virus, uh, preventing it from internalizing into a cell. Uh, for instance, uh, these antibodies can lead to opsonization. So a macrophage can um, sense the antigen, bind to um, the antibody and then cause internalization for degradation. And there's also complement activation where the antibody can then um, uh, mediate uh, complement uh, products and then cause to destruction of either the um, bacteria, but also it can be um, cells as well. Thank you so much. So this is the um, kind of classical view that most people have learned in uh, intro immunology. Um, and, it's, and it's fairly true, uh, just a little over simplistic. Um, and so it's been known for quite some time that the vast majority of antibody made requires T cell help. And people have, you know, typically referred to these as thymus dependent antigens. Uh, and almost all relevant antigens require T cell help, so they're T dependent. There are some instances of repeating polysaccharide units, which you can elicit antibody responses in the absence of T cells. 
but these are more of a, um, uh, a nuanced um, example rather than the, the dogma. <clears throat> so most um, antibody responses require T cell help. Um, and there's really two signals for, for this uh, in classical immunology where antigen binds the B cell, it activates the B cell, and then a second uh, signal is required through T cell help. And um, I include this because it's um, um, uh, more of a historical perspective. So the requirement for T cell help has been known uh, since the 60s where Jacques Miller and Graham Mitchell did classical experiments where they thymectomize, uh, I think it was actually rabbits, um, and they gave them some sort of vaccine um, and they determined that if you take away the thymus uh, of an organism, you lose antibody. And so they developed what's called the antigen bridge model, which you have an antigen um, and then a B cell and T cell bind to that antigen in the same way. And so this was um, the, the classical thought of why you would need uh, T cells in order to get antibody. <clears throat> this was uh, changed a little bit uh, in the mid eighties by Antonio Lenzavecchia and others uh, that came out with a new model, which is now the, the current model of linked recognition where B cells will internalize antigens, uh, that they'll present a portion of that antigen on the surface. This is recognized by the T cell, and then there's um, activation of both cells. And I like to include this because this is an actual figure from a nature paper back in 1985, which was fairly hand-drawn. Um, I don't think you can get away with the hand-drawn figures anymore. So how does linked recognition work? Um, so a given B cell that can only, um, um, when a, a B cell binds to a virus through uh, say a viral coprotein, the B cell will internalize this antigen, in, in this case, the, the whole viral particle, and then degrades the portions of it um, and then presents them um, on MAC class two. These peptides from the antigen will then be presented on class two to T helper cells, but they're really TFH cells, which we'll get back into. And this sends a signal to activate the T cell and the T cell secrete cytokines. And that causes the B cell to um, produce antibodies specific for the antigen that the B cell bound to originally. Um, and one of the examples of this um, is NPOVA. So this is a classical um, vaccine that a lot of people use to study B cell responses. And so NPOVA is essentially an NP haptin, which is this portion here and it's conjugated to albumin, which is a, a, a big protein from eggs. And so T cells themselves can't bind to NP because it's not a protein uh, structure, um, but you can still have T cell dependency because the T cell can bind to the albumin, whereas the B cell can bind to the NP. Um, so the B cell internalizes based on the NP, degrades the whole protein, and then uh, puts portions of OVA on MAC class two, and then the T cell can recognize this, and then you can get antibodies to NP, even though a uh, T cell can never actually see NP as an antigen. And this is important because um, you can trick the immune system into generating some antibody responses. So the um, classical example is the vaccine against Haemophilus influenza, um, which is actually a polysaccharide. Um, but a polysaccharide um, can't be seen by T cells. So what the um, classical vaccine does is they actually conjugated the polysaccharide to Haemophilus influenza uh, to the tetanus toxoid. So all of a sudden you can have T cell help to uh, the protein, even though the T cell itself can't um, recognize the portion of the protein that B cells are specific for and would generate antibody too. So it's a way to trick the immune system into generating responses. And so the take home message here is that um, T cells have to um, recognize the uh, protein, but it doesn't actually have to recognize the antigen, uh, the same antigen as the B cell. Okay, so that's kind of um, how T cells and B cells cooperate in classical immunology. What's, what's the current understanding of, of how this whole process works? And it's a fairly um, intricate process with a lot of steps, but I'll kind of go through them um, one by one. And the um, way in which T cells and B cells interact is in something called the germinal center reaction. And so the germinal center is within the B cell follicle of lymph nodes. So if you envision getting exposed to some sort of pathogen in the periphery, the antigens get brought in. And then the B cell zone, uh, there, there's B cells, um, and they'll interact with T cells in a very stepwise manner. And so this is the oversimplified view, but um, within the first day of antigen exposure, um, some of the antigen will be brought into the B cell follicle through macrophages and, and, and other bystander B cells. 
The B cells will then interact with the CXCL13 expressing stroma. These B cells have high expression of CXCR5, which is the chemokine receptor that pushes them into the B cell follicle. And since the stroma express CXCL13, the B cells will interact with them. There'll be antigen on the surface of the stroma, which the B cell uh, interacts with. This causes downregulation um, or upregulation of CCR7. This will push the B cell from the, um, um, the, the B cell follicle to the TB border. At the TB border, because they, they have CCR7, but they still express CXCR5, so they don't go any deeper. They'll interact with a T cell, and this kind of happens within the first day. The B cell then um, downregulates CCR7 again. The B cell then goes back into the B cell follicle, and then it can form a germinal center, um, which is an accumulation of B cells and T cells. Now, at the same time that the B cell does that, uh, the T cell, when it interacts with a, with a B cell or dendritic cell, it can upregulate something like BCL6, which is the master transcription factor um, for um, uh, T cells that gain access to the B cell follicle. They also downregulate CCR7, which pushes them kind of away from the T cell zone into the B cell follicle. So the T cell can uh, also express CXCR5, which pushes them into the B cell follicle and allow these cells to interact with the B cells in the germinal center, which is physically located in the B cell follicle itself. So there's a lot of cells that are required for this kind of stepwise evolution uh, of a germinal center. So early B cell responses involve B cells, of course, uh, T follicular helper cells, which are the T cells that can gain access to the B cell follicle. It also requires follicular dendritic cells, which uh, have an unfortunate uh, name because they're not actually related to classical hematopoietic dendritic cells, they're actually a stromal cell that just have dendrites, which is why they're called follicular dendritic cells. And obviously they're in the follicle. So these are the different kind of steps that, that give you this T cell, B cell interaction. And so one of the questions is, what do these B cells do when they interact with the um, follicular dendritic cells? There's a number of things that can happen. So the follicular dendritic cell um, can express FC gamma receptors, so they can bind uh, antibody on the surface. Uh, they also have complement receptors, so they can bind to complement um, and um, antibodies bound immune, immune complexes. They can also um, express CD40 ligand, which is an important um, to interact with CD40 on the B cell to uh, mediate survival signals. There's also adhesion molecules and scavenger receptors on the FDC. There's obviously cytokines like CXCL13, uh, which can uh, bind to CXCR5 and, and provide um, um, cues for uh, positioning. But um, basically the B cell will get some, will scan the FDC and if there's antigen, it'll send a very small signal into the B cell that allows the cell to become primed and then go to the TB border. And so at the TB border, um, the B cell will interact with T follicular helper cells. So what is a T follicular helper cell? A T follicular helper cell is a CD4 T cell that can specialize in B cell help and it can gain access to the B cell follicle. And so this is a um, schematic by um, Shane Crotty. Uh, and essentially what this shows is that if you have a non-TFH cell, so a CD4 T cell in the T cell zone, if you interact with a dendritic cell, and this is a hematopoietic dendritic cell, not the follicular dendritic cell, again, unfortunate nomenclature, um, if the conditions are right, a subset of these will differentiate into a T follicular helper cell. These cells can then gain access to the TB border. If they get uh, an interaction with a B cell, they'll go deeper into the German, into the B cell follicle, into the germinal center, and they'll interact with B cells to um, mediate them to um, differentiate into plasmoblasts or plasma cells, which will produce antibody. And there's a stepwise differentiation of these TFH cells. So um, a naive cell will interact with a dendritic cell um, through antigen uh, signals. Um, then if the conditions are right, uh, you need a dendritic cell, you need ICOS, you need some cytokines as well. Um, you have um, these TFH cells, which will upregulate BCL6, which is the master transcription factor um, for TFH cells. They'll also um, start to upregulate CXCR5, which is important for positioning them into the TB border. Um, that's not the only signals that's required. You also require an activated cognate B cell to further give signals to the TFH cell so you can have more BCL6 and more CXCR5. And then eventually this cell will go into a germinal center and further interact with the germinal center B cell. This will give you the, the highest BCL6 expression and also the highest C, uh, CXCR5 expression. 
And so there's an initiation maintenance and full polarization uh, kind of stages of TFH development. And you really need this full polarization in order to help the B cell um, to produce antibody. And a lot's been known about the signaling in, in uh, TFH cells. Um, so CXCR5 is on the, on the surface that allows them to gain access to the B cell follicle. And once they interact with an antigen presenting cell, either the B cell or the dendritic cell, there's a number of signals that are extremely important, such as ICOS. Um, this is important for signaling into the cell um, to mediate um, higher uh, CXCR5 and BCL6 expression. Um, Co-stimulatory molecules um, are also important, uh, CD80, CD86. Uh, there's other adhesion molecules, CD84, Li108, and SLAM, which also are important um, for activation of the TFH cell. But I guess for um, purposes of this talk, the most important to know is that the TFH cells will produce IL-4, uh, which is an extremely important uh, in mediating B cells to produce antibody. And they also can secrete IL-21. And IL-21 is another cytokine that's, that's essential for B cells to produce antibody. Uh, the IL-4 knockout or the IL-21 knockout are, have diminished antibody responses. If you have the double knockout, you actually don't really have any antibody responses at all. Um, there's also some negative signals for TFH cells, such as IL-2 signaling, um, so, uh, which is actually not shown here. But um, IL-2 signaling through STAT-5 can inhibit TFH cells or signals through STAT3 can promote TFH cells. And a lot of the adjuvants that are in development for vaccines um, specifically try and optimize the TFH development as part of the mechanism for generating good antibody responses. Okay, so after you know, three days, the B cells have already gone to the TB border. They go back into the B cell follicle. Uh, the T cells have differentiated into TFH cells. They down regulate CCR7 upregulate CXCR5, they go into the germinal center. And then here the T cells can interact with a cognate B cell and then give you a germinal center reaction that um, will give you antibody responses. So within the germinal center, um, this looks like one location, but it's actually, um, there's um, subdivisions within the germinal center, which is called the light zone and dark zone. Uh, and so the dark zone is called the dark zone um, because there's no T cells present, there are only B cells, whereas the light zone is called the light zone because on immunofluorescence, they're CD4 positive because this is where the TFH cells are. And so a lot occurs here. So the TFH cell will interact with a uh, B cell in an antigen specific manner. Uh, again, linked recognition is important. Uh, this will activate um, the B cell to go into the light zone within the, or go into the dark zone. Within the dark zone, there's no TFH cells present. The signals though that it received in the light zone will cause proliferation and somatic copy mutation, uh, which we'll get back to in a little bit. Um, these cells will then recycle out of the dark zone and come back and interact with the TFH cell again. Uh, this is important because then it can further enhance the affinity of the B cell receptor. Um, <clears throat> If the um, B cell doesn't um, come into contact with the TFH cell again, it will undergo apoptosis. This is a way to ensure that um, when B cells um, uh, increase the affinity of the B cell receptor that they ensure it's productive. And so if you don't uh, interact with the TFH cell again, you just undergo apoptosis. So ultimately after a number of rounds of this uh, interaction, the B cell will then further differentiate into a memory B cell uh, which just waits for antigen re-exposure, or it'll differentiate into a plasma blast or plasma cell. And these are the cells that will secrete large amounts of um, high affinity antibody. And the number of rounds it goes through is, is unclear, um, but what is known is that the B cell has to go through a number of rounds through the light zone and dark zone recycling in order to have a productive somatic copy mutation and to differentiate into a memory uh, B cell or a plasma cell. Um, and so because the B cells will expand here, is that the germinal center is a site where there's clonal expansion of the B cells. And so looking here, um, this is an experiment done by uh, Gabriel Victoria's lab, um, where essentially they have a tool in which each B cell after it undergoes um, class switching will turn a color. And this is the uh, confetti mouse. And so when they give these mice tamoxifen, it turns on the confetti allele and if there's clonal expansion, it'll choose one of the 12 colors. And if you have a germinal center that's only one color, it means that only a single B cell clone actually dominates that germinal center. 
And if you can see here, this is um, um, 20 days post vaccination with a classical uh, vaccine. And you look at all these different germinal centers, you can see that some germinal centers like here and here actually have a pretty polyclonal B cell um, composition. But other germinal centers like here and here um, actually have a monoclonal um, single clonality uh, germinal center where they're all right here because there's one clone that dominated. Um, and it's not quite clear why um, a single germinal center will only have one clone and what the benefit is of having multiple clones, but there's competition that's, that matters for resources that allow the highest affinity clones to, to grow out. I know it's germinal center biology is very, very complicated. <laughs> And so what else happens within the germinal center? There's also somatic hypermutation. So somatic hypermutation um, allows mutations and antibodies to increase the affinity for antigen. And so germline uh, sequences of antibodies tend to be lower affinity. And so this is a way that antibodies can increase their affinity so they can be more productive or more efficient. And so this happens because the germinal center B cell has high expression of the um, death receptor FAS and TFH cells have high expression of fast receptor. So as the TFH cells interacting with the B cell, um, this uh, fast will be ligated by fast ligand. It'll send an apoptosis signal into the B cell. So in the germinal center, the default message is actually apoptosis in the B cell. However, this apoptosis can be overcome um, if you have enough co-stimulation and um, signaling through cytokines. And so all germinal center B cells will die. Uh, but if you get enough co-stimulation by the TFH cell or um, a high amount of cytokines like IL-21 and IL-4, this will cause enough activation signals to overcome the apoptosis signal so that only the most efficient um, B cells survive. The other important signal here is through the B cell receptor. And so if you have a high affinity BCR because of somatic copy mutation, this will um, send a larger signal into the B cell for activation and survival. And so the BCR plus TFH help are the two signals that allow the cell to overcome uh, apoptosis. And in fact, FAST is a marker of germinal center B cells used by flow cytometry. Um, and so when somatic hypermutation occurs, <clears throat> um, it occurs uh, only after the cells are in the germinal center. And this is actually quite important um, to prevent um, lymphomas and other types of cancers. So when you look at the different genes, so this is the variable region of the, the heavy chain uh, and the kappa light chain um, and the constant uh, region. In naive cells, there's very little mutations. They're all germline. <clears throat> However, in germinal center B cells, you can see there's actually quite a bit of mutation frequency uh, in humans. <coughs> and this is also occurs uh, very heavily in, in memory B cells. And this is different, and this is only the variable regions of um, antibodies, not the constant regions, which don't undergo somatic type of mutation. Well, you notice there's some other genes that um, can be mutated, um, such as MYC, BCL6, et cetera. And actually, this is um, because the machinery that um, induces somatic hyper mutation is not perfect in its targeting. So every once in a while, it can hit something like MYC um, or FAS or BCL6, and this can cause um, lymphoproliferative uh, syndromes. Uh, but for the most part, the mutations are contained within just the variable region of antibodies. So the culmination of this germinal center reaction uh, is that the B cell uh, undergoes somatic hypermutation, and then it can come out and produce a high affinity antibody, which is important for um, clearing whatever pathogen you're exposed to. Um, but I'm not, not all antibodies are the same. Um, so in a classical uh, immunology lens, um, different uh, isotypes of antibodies um, are induced by different types of cytokines, and it's thought that uh, specific subtypes of TFH cells uh, or other danger signals can induce different isotypes, uh, either IgM, you know, IgG1, 2, 3, etc. And so there's different cytokines that can in induce different antibody class switching. And each isotype gives slightly different effector functions, uh, helping to clear the pathogen. <clears throat> and so there's also differential B cell fates after the germinal center reaction. So um, a B cell can either become a plasma cell or a memory B cell. And so in the germinal center reaction, in the early germinal center reaction, you have memory B cells that grow out. Uh, memory B cells express BCL6. They kind of reside within the lymph node, um, but they can also recirculate. 
uh, and they can respond rapidly upon antigen re-exposure. The uh, memory B cells actually occur quite early uh, in the germinal center response, whereas late in the germinal center response, plasma cells can form. These uh, express XBP1 and the transcription factor BLIMP1. Um, they actually leave the lymph node and mostly reside within the bone marrow where they're protected from you know, any kind of antigen uh, or, or any exposure to the environment um, that allows the plasma cells to persist for long periods of time and secrete uh, antibody for long periods of time. So the two fates are either death, um, formation of plasma cell, or formation, formation of a memory B cell. <clears throat> and why would you want to form a memory B cell? So memory B cells enable very quick expansion. And so this is actually a recent study by Michael McKaiser Williams lab at Scripps. And essentially what they're showing here is if they do a, uh, give a vaccine for NP, um, if you, um, at, the, at day zero, uh, when they give the vaccine, there's no um, antigen specific B cells. At day 14, uh, which is the, the height of the response, you start to see some and it wanes by day 70. If you give a boost without adjuvant, so just a soluble boost, within four days, you can um, expand the number of antigen-specific B cells by 55-fold. Whereas the primary response, it takes 14 days to get the peak uh, of B cell responses. Um, in a secondary response, it actually only takes four days. And you don't need an adjuvant either, <clears throat> although an adjuvant can, can help. Um, and so this is a way in which memory B cells can expand very quickly. So if you get exposed to a new pathogen, you can <clears throat> produce antibody extremely quickly uh, so you're protected quicker. <coughs> okay, so what controls B cell tolerance um, and to ensure that B cells don't produce antibodies specific for self-antigens leading to autoimmunity? And um, we always like to throw some, some history in here. So here's some classical um, tolerance experiments done by Chris Goodnow in Australia. So in these experiments, they take a mouse which expresses hen egg lysozyme. So it's a transgenic for HEL. They then cross these mice to mice that um, express B cells, that B cell receptors only uh, recognize HEL. So it's a mouse that expresses the antigen and there's a separate mouse <coughs> where the B cells uh, can recognize the antigen. They then cross these mouse mice and saw what happens. And so what they found, and this was back in the late 80s, but <coughs> They've updated that since then. In a non-transgenic, you don't have any um, B cell specific for the antigen. If you have a B cell um, or the transgenic in which the, all the B cell receptors are specific for HEL, you obviously see them in periphery. They have high expression of IgM, which is essentially the B cell receptor, and they can bind HEL with a very high affinity. If you have the double transgenic, so the B cells can recognize HEL, but the mouse also expresses HEL as a protein, um, what they found is that they still express IgM. They're still there. They're not deleted like uh, T cells in central tolerance, but the IgM expression is much lower. So the BCR um, um, quantity on the surface is lower, and they also bind to slightly less of the antigen, suggesting that um, a self-antigen um, within a mouse, the B cells that are specific for it are defective because they don't have as high expression of, B, of the BCR um, um, and it doesn't bind as much high affinity. So there's a way that the immune system can regulate tolerance um, to antibodies. So how do T cells control uh, germinal center responses? Um, one of the biology uh, areas of biology that, that we worked on in my lab uh, don't worry, I won't go into it in detail. I won't, I won't bore people. But one of the areas that we're particularly interested in is how the immune system can control antibody responses. And whereas the TFH cells will stimulate B cells to undergo uh, somatic hypermutation, form a germinal center B cell, and produce memory B cells and plasma cells, there's also regulatory populations that can prevent this from happening. And so these are called TFR cells that can suppress B cell responses because these cells are a FOXP3 positive regulatory population. And so the T cell compartment also has ways to ensure that uh, B cell responses are appropriate uh, in both their specificity as well as duration. So there's multiple layers of regulation uh, of B cell responses. Okay, so now switching gears a little bit, one of the questions is what do antibodies do? Um, most people think that antibodies are all the same. They just block um, 
um, viruses from entry into their um, um, entry receptors. But antibodies actually have quite a number of functions. And this function is partially dictated by the isotype. And so IgM doesn't really do all that much uh, functionally, although it is really good at activating complement. Um, there's other functional activities that the IgG subsets can undergo, such as neutralization, opsonization, sensitization for killing by NK cells. Uh, sensitization for NK cell killing is quite important in transplant. Um, sensitization of mast cells, which only really happens with IgE uh, during allergies. And the distribution is also different. <clears throat> so only certain subsets like IgA can be transported across the epithelium. Um, only IgG1 and, and sometimes IgG3 can be transported across the placenta. So, uh, so during birth, um, uh, the mother will give uh, IgG antibodies um, uh, to the fetus uh, to protect them until they can um, develop their own immune system, but this is only IgG. Uh, there's also a differential diffusion into extravascular sites. Um, and there's also different mean serum levels with the highest being IgG1 um, and the lowest being IgE although IgE is extremely potent at mediating allergies. So even though it's a very low um, amount, uh, it can be very potent. And some of this uh, activity is dictated by FC receptors. Um, and I won't go into these in detail because there's so many and it actually differs between mice and humans. Um, but there's a number of FC receptors. Um, most of them um, are activating receptors, um, but some of these um, can be inhibitory. Uh, such as like FC gamma R2B, which actually has an ITIM motif and can inhibit um, the cells that express it. Um, <clears throat> others have really high affinity, like the FC epsilon receptor, which combined IgE um, actually has a, a really high affinity um, for IgE, uh, whereas others have um, a, a lower affinity. <clears throat> and these different FC receptors are expressed on different cell types, and so they can also mediate different functions based on the cell type in which they uh, are expressed. <laughs> some of these can induce um, um, uptake, some of them can induce uh, granular release um, and other functions. And so the not just producing an antibody is important for um, clearance of pathogens, but it's also important what kind of antibody it is, what the affinity is, um, and the FC uh, region, which will dictate its, its function. It's also important to note that some of these, even the FC gamma receptors, can have different affinities based on the isotype. Um, which also complicates um, the biology. And I'll get back to that uh, in a couple slides uh, when we discuss transplantation antibody rejection. So that's kind of a whirlwind um, um, view of uh, immunology 101 as it revolves around antibody responses. Now one of the questions is, um, how are these similar or different in the context of transplantation? And I won't go into too much detail here <clears throat> because it's not uh, essentially my field, but um, um, antibodies are extremely important in transplantation. Um, obviously, uh, MHC matching um, happens to avoid uh, hypercute rejection, uh, but even with HLA matching, there are still issues that occur. So there's about 100,000 patients on the kidney transplant waiting list, and the average weight, weight on the uh, list is about four years, and about 5% of patients die each year while waiting. Um, after transplantation, 20% of patients with low immunological risk, so they are matched to the best of everyone's abilities, uh, still will develop de novo donor-specific antibodies within five years. And once de novo DSA develops, about 10% of patients will lose their graft within one year, about 25% within three years. And one of the un unfortunate um, issues is that immunosuppression doesn't really, it can treat acute rejection, which is you know acute cellular rejection, but it can't really treat chronic antibody immune rejection. And so there's a lack of tools to um, inhibit antibody responses in the context of, of uh, transplantation. Um, it's still early days on understanding how allo-specific antibodies are regulated, uh, but what is known is that um, t flicker helper cells, which we discussed earlier, um, directly correlate with donor-specific antibody um, as well as antibody immune rejection in humans. And this was done in two studies. Whereas t regulatory cells, which can inhibit antibody responses, actually inversely correlate with antibody, re antibody immune rejection in humans. <clears throat> so it seems as though, the, at least on a first approximation, the machinery required for antibody responses by the immune system um, is still there and it still mediates antibody responses to alloantigens. Because essentially, a 
patient that gets a transplant sees the, the transplant as a foreign uh, invading pathogen and mounts an antibody response to it. Um, but not all antibody responses are the same in the, in the context of vaccines and, and whatnot. Um, as long as you have an antibody that can neutralize the virus, it's effective, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated in transplants. Um, so it's not just the level of donor specific antibody, um, it's also um, its effector function. And so I won't go into detail in, into um, the literature, but this is a nice summary here of all the different uh, studies that have looked at um, donor specific antibody and its effector functions. And essentially the take home message is that um, the most detrimental donor specific antibodies uh, will target uh, HLA um, and they have to be able to um, fix complement. And so if you can um, complement activating uh, donor specific antibodies, um, you do much worse um, and there's a higher risk of uh, allograft loss. So it's not just total donor specific antibody, you actually um, seem to require complement activation for it to lead to transplant rejection. There's obviously some, um, some caveats there, but, but that's the, the, the current dogma. And how does this rejection occur? Um, so in the um, complement um, mediated um, rejection, so the anti-HLA antibody uh, will bind uh, to HLA antigens on endothelial cells. This will activate the classical complement pathway, uh, which leads to um, the membrane attack complex on the endothelial cells. This leads to stimulation, uh, which leads to a lot of changes within the endothelial cells, which then ultimately leads to thrombosis. And in pathology, um, C4 uh, deposition um, within the kidney, in this, in this case, kidney transplants, um, um, leads to uh, a rejection uh, of, the, of the graft itself. Okay, so what are the strategies to eliminate antibody mu rejection? Okay, so there's, there's a lot. I mean, one is better MHC matching, which is probably essentially impossible because there's so many major and minor histocompatibility antigens that are present. It's also important to note that antibody responses are one of the um, reasons why xenotransplantation doesn't really work. Um, but that's um, getting better with different um, knockout um, 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 animals. But nonetheless, it's probably going to be impossible to eliminate all um, alloantigens. Immunosuppression can work. Um, it's, it's expensive. It's not very targeted, but it can alleviate some uh, acute uh, antibody, but not really chronic antibody. Um, but again, it's expensive and has to be um, continuously given. Um, IVIG, so trying to flood the system with antibody, a relevant antibody to block all the FC receptors. That can also work um, for a limited time, but it's a limited utility. Um, antibody de degrading enzymes have also um, have appeared. And so essentially what this does is it's uh, enzymes that will degrade antibodies so they're no longer functional. Um, so this can work, but it doesn't really get rid of the plasma cells that produce the antibody. Um, so you would have to give them for, for quite a long time. Um, but one of the, the, the best options, if it's possible, is to induce tolerance. And so I showed you about um, the classical Goodnow experiments uh, in which B cell tolerance can be induced. Um, and this is from, uh, from David Sachs, who I saw on the, on the call, so he could probably give this better than me. But um, there's been a number of um, 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 tolerance, uh, ways of inducing tolerance uh, across MHC barriers in mice. But unfortunately, not a lot of them have translated into primates, except for mixed, mixed chimerism. And obviously, this has um, been largely successful in humans um, by David Sachs and, and, and others' work, uh, where if you have a mixed chimerism, then it leads to um, transplant tolerance. Um, the issue here is that um, um, performing mixed chimerism in humans is, is, a, is a complicated process that, that also has um, some issues um, to it. So one of the issues is um, where the field is going as it revolves around antibody rejection is how do you induce tolerance without having to do the chimerism? And there's no good answer, but um, one of the things um, I just want to tell you about, there was a new study that um, Anita Chong's lab um, has published. And essentially what this is, is a uh, mouse model of um, transplant tolerance in which you have naive B6 mice um, they, they then transplant a uh, uh, BALB-C uh, heart into these B6 mice. They can then give um, anti-CD-154 
as well as donor splenocytes. And the idea is that the donor splenocytes, along with um, um, attenuating the B cells, will lead to tolerance. And that's just kind of shown here with uh, hard graft uh, loss in um, acute rejection, about seven days. If they're tolerant, they go out today 80 plus. And this will also prevent um, the donor specific antibody. One of the interesting things here is not only do you prevent uh, donor specific antibody with this um, kind of a tolerance induction, one of the other interesting things is that it's a long term tolerance. And if you look here, if you tr uh, adopt transfer the B cells, um, the tolerant B cells um, no longer are able to um, give a valve C donor specific antibody, but they're actually fine in responding to third party antigens suggesting that it's possible to trick the B cells into becoming tolerant to a specific antigen. And this can be a long-term tolerance um, and it can be one that you reserve the um, intact immune system so you can respond to antigens uh, later on. Um, ways to do this in, in non-human primates uh, as well as in humans are still, are still being developed. <laughs> but it's important to note that in humans, um, when the um, um, mixed chimerism occurs, you don't have to have chimerism for a long time in order to get this tolerance injection, uh, induction. So possibly it might be something that can be done in, in humans as well. So that's pretty much it. That was a whirlwind through um, B cell responses and, uh, and, and transplantation. Um,